This beautiful music is by Denis Bouillon, the subject of our program today on the morning concert. I'm Charles Armerkanian, and on this program we'll be listening to works by this very young composer, born in Grand Mere, a small town in the province of Quebec in Canada, in 1955. Denis Bouillon is a uh, French-Canadian composer, but as um, many of the uh, subjects of our programs in the Music from Germany series running in this month of October 1987 on KPFA, he is a transplanted uh, composer living in Cologne and working there uh, for many years now. He grew up uh, in Quebec was a guitarist in an amateur rock group uh, throughout his adolescence, and then began to study music through a series of events which are described in our interview, which was recorded recently, in Cologne. The music you're hearing now is Rituel Lapidaire, which is for English horn and vibraphone, a beautiful 21-minute long piece, and is one of a series of uh, pieces written in different styles to which we'll be exposed on this program. I think you'll enjoy this composer's work. So now we take you to uh, Germany for a visit with this uh, talented young musician, the subject of our program today, Denis Bouillon. This is Charles Amerikanian in Cologne. It's June 1st, 1987, and I'm visiting with Denis Bouillon, who is a composer born in Canada, in French Canada, and who has been living in Cologne for now seven years. And his music was very highly re- recommended to me by my friend George Ligeti, and so it's a pleasure to present his music for the first time in California on KPFA over this broadcast. Denny, you began as a as an electric guitar player in a rock band, and now you're a composer writing very complicated music. You must have uh, worked very hard to master music notation and instrumentation. How did you make that transition? Uh, actually, uh, it's a very common phenomenon in in Canada actually where the music education program in the school is not very very developed that people get an interest for let's say more well classical music or whatever that means uh, some somewhat later in their life so what I did actually I was very curious always but I had no not much opportunity to go to concerts I was listening to, to records I mean rock records and then I went uh, to a friend's place which was a member of our band and his father had a big record collection and then I noted that his father was, well, he knew quite a lot about music, and he was open. So in the pile of records, which I used to borrow every week, he just slipped one or two classical records. And of course, he was wise enough to slip uh, Stravinsky and things like that. I think if he had slipped like a Schubert quartet, I wouldn't have been ready to listen to that. But of course, as I, with 19, listened for the first time uh, to the Rite of Spring, uh, of course, that was some sort of a shock. And I was so fascinated... Then I decided, well, how is this written? How do people communicate such music? And the, the impetus was so strong that I decided I'm going to enroll in a music school and, 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 and figure out how you can write those things in a very, <laughs> very naive way. And of course, I made, the, I made the exam, you know, the entrance exam, and I was, I was not accepted because I had no, no uh, uh, musical training. But uh, they told me, okay, if you, we'll give you one year, work with yourself, we can advise you, uh, give you to a private teacher, and if you can reach at least a minimum level, then you might try. And I did that. And within one year, I reached a minimum level, of course, reading music and being able to take music dic- dictations and the whole thing. And what I did most, actually, is I listened to a lot of music. Of course, getting back again to my, my friend's father, which had a very nice record collection, then I listened to hundreds and hundreds of records. And I was not the best in technique, but I was the best in spotting what's that music. You wouldn't. You you can. Uh, you could play me anything, and I could say, "Oh, yeah, this I know, I know, I know." So, I I I develop a musical co- culture in a snap, so to say, within two years. Does the person from Quebec have a tradition to draw on? Actually, no. Um, uh, it's very nice because I'm I'm living here in Cologne, but I'm very often in Canada. I mean, as often as I can, every year at least. And I was last year. I was doing a broadcast in uh, for the CBC in Montreal with a musicologist there. And he was presenting me as uh, being um, in the third generation of composer in Canada, which is very funny. I mean, uh, it's nice to hear. That means uh, the third generation were people which were more or less academical, which were happy enough when they were be able to write like Scriabin or, or 
well, the most advanced with, with Tri Vares, you know, or Hindemith. And the second generation were people which were a little bit more um, up to date, actually. We had our small boulets, we had our small, you know, I don't want to, to be nasty to anybody, but that was necessary step. And I think my generation is probably the first which actually is trying to come with fresh ideas. I don't mean we achieve it, you just for yourself, but uh, where we don't have this complex anymore that we have to imitate. We're just trying to do our own thing. Why do you live in, in Germany rather than Canada, where there's a good government support also for music, huh? That's true, that's true. Um, uh, well, uh, to be funny, actually, I'm trying to profit from both sides, you know. Uh, I had that choice, you know, I made the, the, the regular university studies with up, up to, up to the, 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 the master's degree, and after that I started teaching, actually, two years, harmony and counterpoint and all those things, and, well, I was quite young, I was, I was like 24, 25, and decided, well, I didn't study music or enroll in a music school to be to become a teacher, actually. I, I don't dislike teaching, but that I didn't want this to become my main preoccupation. So I decided I'm going to go try to work with somebody else, and somebody which I respect very much. And I, I well, I like Ligeti music very much, and not only did I like it, but I, respe I respected it very much for its all uh, its historical uh, significance also. So, uh, very naively, I wrote letters over letters to Hamburg, where he teaches, and I always got the same photocopy letter, uh, the class is full for the next coming 20 years or something like that. And I said, okay, I'm going to look myself. And I packed my whole, all my things in two suitcases. And I came here in Cologne, not knowing anybody. I knew what was happening through through reading and magazine and things, but I didn't know anybody personally. So I came here, and I I made my way th up to Hamburg and knocked at every every door. And I well asked to to pass an exam. And because normally Ligeti would take somebody which is finished with the with the normal studies, which is uh, of course understandable. And they made me pass the uh, the um, the um, the last exam, the final exam of the, of the whole Schule there. And after that, well, they decided, okay, if you really want to meet him, then okay, okay, go and meet him. You'll see what happens. And, I mean, and then I decided, well, I'm going to work with him. It was very hard at the beginning. I mean, Nigiti is a very fantastic person, but it's quite hard. And that's actually what I was looking for. Somebody which is going to crush your head, you know, and, and you have to bang your head on the wall. And he pushed me, uh, he decided, okay, if you're going to, to, to continue to write in that style, I was I was like writing a pseudo Varese style or post Varese style, and not as good as Varese, of course. <laughs> and he told me, why why do you do that? Try to find something else. Try to find your own thing. And this was a big, big, big help, a big stimulation. Of course, he didn't come up with any suggestion. I had to find what I wanted to do. And after five years then, uh, uh, studying with him, I was sort of, yeah, becoming more more or less European. So I decided, okay, I'm going to, to remain here and try to make the best of the situation, coming back and forth to Canada as, as, as soon as I can, as often as I can, but trying to have my music played in Europe, of course. It's no secret there's a big music scene in Germany, for example. There are a lot of possibilities. Uh, okay, uh, getting played is another story, but the, possibility, the possibilities are there. So I thought, if I, I've, I've learned German in the meantime, I can read, I can express myself, I, I'll try to make a living. If I if I wanted to come back to Canada, I could pro possibly find a, a job somewhere teaching. But I just, I thought, well, I'm going to risk, take the risk and play the game. So I. So your daily life is uh, one of composing rather than teaching. To yes, survive, yes, yeah. yes. Of course, I'm doing all sort of small things, you know, like making the the, the regie for the ensemble Kern, like when they need tape, you know, to synchronize and things like that. Or once in a while, a few radio broadcasts for the CBC in Canada and French. What was your most recent performance, for example, this this summer? Uh, the last the last thing was last week in uh, in Paris, with Ensemble Itinéraire, where they played a piece of mine at uh, Centre Pompidou. That was my first piece in 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 in, uh, in Frankreich and in France. Sorry for the German word. That's okay. Uh, and you went to Paris yourself? Then? Yes, I was there in Paris. It must have been a thrill. To yes, actually, because... Uh, it's your native language, for one thing. Yes, yes. It's a different culture, but it's my language. I, and I I, uh, I, express my, I can express myself quite decently in French, so to say. And that was nice. And I, I like Paris very much, of course. I mean, uh, it's not that I don't like Germany, but it's for a different reason, you know. I like the, the way of life in Paris. I'm a more Latin person. I'm not... I'm not uh, uh, I have nothing uh, Teuton or Teutonic in my nature. No, it's more Latin. We're talking with Denis Bouillon, and uh, we're going to begin our program with 
a very interesting piece that he wrote uh, between 1979 and 1980 and then revised uh, the following year. It's called Jeu de Soci Société, huh? Exactly. Uh, games of Society? Yeah, or Society Games, simply. No, it's in several movements. It's in five movements, yes. Maybe, maybe you could tell us something overall about the piece and then about the individual movements. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's a woodwind quintet and piano. And uh, this is actually my first piece. Woodwind quintet. Yes. And piano. And piano, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah. And that's actually my first piece. Uh, I had the idea before I came to, to Germany, but uh, that was not... I didn't have the, the means, actually, to, to do it. So um, I needed some sort of, of distance, you know. I, I started over, like I, I told you, with, with Ligeti. And um, I decided, well, I'm going to amuse myself because that was very difficult, so I had to find a way to, to refresh, you know, myself a little bit. So I decided, I decided I'm going to do something very, very simple, games, just games. And this came from, of course, a, a, a deeper motivation. I mean, I really realized I had no musical tradition to, uh, to, to, uh, to be responsible for, that's what I mean. Of course, I had learned music like everybody else, but that I was not responsible for that music, which I learned at school. And I decided I'm going to amuse myself and playing with the tradition. Well, instead would, of wouldn't a French Canadian naturally go toward folk music of, of that area as a, to draw on? This is one possibility. This is one possibility. But for me, that would have meant be, being, becoming too much tied with my... There's a strong folk tradition, that's, that's true. But it's a more literature, a more literal one. You know, we have a very nice uh, uh, tradition for theater, novel, uh, poetry. Uh, but that that was not exactly my my feel. I was more interested in music, so I could not directly draw from that. That was not exactly the. the so point. what did you do instead? So I I decided. Well, I'm going to f try to find a way to play with tradition. That means I'm I have a, like a, a pot there. And I'm going to draw from all sort of things which I like, which I interest, and just try to mix them together and find out what what comes out of all that. So, the, the, this was all, there was also one very important thing. Um, I didn't want to quote any tradition, though. I wanted to uh, to give the illusion of the tradition. So I decided I'm going to try to find a way to become a perfect illusionist, magician. And I developed. Uh, there was a very very well one or two years of very technical. Yeah, trying to develop something technically, the tools which I needed, and I developed a sort of transformation system, which enables me, for example, to go very close to a certain given musical uh, fragment without ink being without being a quotation, but going very close to this, alluding to it very closely, and then going away from it gradually, without steps, very gradually, and. Um, and that was also this came from the idea that I I wanted to make my transformation as clear as possible. If you're going to make uh, complex music, I mean in the, in a more or less serial or f uh, formalized world, if you are taking a, a fragment which is in itself very complex, if you're going to per make permutation of that fragment, you cannot expect the listener to follow what you're doing. Of course, you, it can be interesting music. It's not the criteria, but for me, the more important thing is that the listener has to be aware of what's happening. And for that, I, I decided that my my um, uh, my base material would be something which is already live, you know, common, which everybody knows, actually, in a given. I don't mean, I don't mean that the people in, in India would probably respond to those cultural signals, but I mean in the Western hemisphere, let's say, it would be like the common language. What's the instrumentation of the piece? So, uh, you have the normal woodwind quintet, the five flute, oboe, clarinet, horn, and bassoon, and the piano. Now, the piano plays a particular kind of role in this piece uh, as a soloist. Uh, depending on the games, I can describe you the several games, and depending on the games, it will it will play different roles. Actually. In the first game, the first game is a hide and seek game. So, what you have is every instrumental player of the woodwind quintet having its own little motive, and uh, it's very interesting what happens. Uh, in, in in that type of game, everybody go and hides, and there's one which looks after, which tries to to catch all of them, and the pianist in that game tries to catch the the the, the woodman players, and it gives rise musically to a very interesting canon phenomenon. You see, so what I did is that let's say the oboe is peering out of his you know his hide, and the the pianist sees him, so so 
uh, musically, the oboe plays a motive and the piano tries to play this motive and catch him and to synchronize with it. <laughs> and when he synchronizes with it, then the oboe is, is out of the game. The, the pianist has caught him, actually, literally. And what happens, it's like uh, the five are starting very, very, very uh, precautiously, caution, cautiously. Everybody gets his nose out, out of his hide and gradually the pianist finds to find its way and, and catches one after the other, catches them. And at the end, there's one which is a little bit faster and obviously wins the game. But musically, what happens is a very, very complex canon and reaction process between tr making one step forward and then two steps backward and forward again, you know, and the piano trying to imitate that. So it gives rise to a very interesting musical, purely musical phenomenon.
The second moment is uh, what I call a telephone game. I don't know if that's the right expression in, in America for that. I mean, ex- yeah, there, it's it's a game where you sit in a circle and one person tells another thing something, exactly. whispers, and exactly. then it goes on around. I, there is a name for it, but it slips my mind because I'm yeah, in yes. Germany right now. So. We, we we call it Arab telephone in Quebec, Arabic telephone or something like that for whatever reason. Uh, and this also gives rise to a very interesting musical phenomenon if you want to to make it musically. So what happens? You have very, very short motives, actually one note at the beginning, which is transferred from one instrument to the other. And gradually, the, the message will change through those whisperings, listening, and, and, and uh, giving uh, again, uh, will change. And what started like a pseudo vibern, rather, rather uh, um, clear-cut pointillistic style, will evolve gradually through, through those transformations into something which I would call like Hollywood kitsch at the end. It's, it's like, and it goes through Ravel, through, through a little bit of Ligeti, poking fun a little bit. And There's no quotation, but you, you have the impression that you're moving through different styles, but without a break, very, very gradually. So that's this, this telephone game gave me the idea of a stylistical, uh, uh, magical uh, transformation, so to say.
third moment of society game is uh, a poker game. I, I wanted to do something with cards. So every uh, every player has five cards. That means five sounds, five notes. And uh, what happens that the piano player in that case will, uh, the one which will distribute the cards. So at the end you have also a phenomenon which, which uh, is expressed in a musical way. The piano gives one card to each player. So the player tries to do his best with this one note. It's very little, but he, he does his best. The, the, the piano player makes a second round and gives a second note, so everybody has two notes, and so on, until everybody has five notes. And there's a section, a middle section, which is a bluff, the bluff section, where everybody tries to make the stronger combination out of his five notes. You see? And this is a very interesting musical, mu musical phenomenon also, with only five notes, trying to organize it in a way that it's, it stands out of the whole out of the hole. And at the end, uh, there's one which, which again is cleverer and, um, well, wins the game. And, well, you'll guess who it is. <laughs>
is a um, interlude and of course interludus in, in latin it's between the games you see so it's it's a uh, it's a word play on interlude and what it is actually it's um, there's absolutely no game it's only a cloud of sound it's a purely uh, 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 hedonic uh, 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 hedonistic he- hedonistic yeah uh, just uh, for pleasure huh? exactly uh, play uh, on on sound Maybe it's a hot tub or something. Well, it could well be. I mean, I thought that the listener needed some sort of of of, uh, of rest, so to say. It's only three or four minutes, three and a half minutes, I think, and it has absolutely no dialectic in it, no game, no nothing. It's just it just stands like pure. But uh, instrumentally, it's quite interesting. It sounds very it sounds very strange because there are very very special uh, doublings with a piano. Is it a reference in any way to Ligeti's early music? Um, uh, it is probably. Unconsciously, one, and that's probably the reason why. That's I think that's uh, the movement which Leakey likes uh, the least. <laughs>
Now for the last moment, I chose an English title, which is Gossip. Because there's no exact French translation for, for gossiping. There are several ways. You, you, you have to build a, a sentence around it. There's not such one word which will describe it. So, uh, the last moment is a play on two uh, uh, clichés of music. Uh, one is a scale, a very simple scale, which goes like that. So the 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 melody goes like. It's a it's a scale which uh, revolves in itself. It's like a snake which which bites its own tail. And the second element is a very a, a very cliche uh, chord progression. Uh, it's this type of progression which you have very very often in tonal music. Normally it it's, it's ends with a cadence, you know. But of course I don't use the cadence. So what I use is only that. And I, I give a sort of a funky rhythm to it. You see? It's all it, those two elements are very, very short, very simple. And what I'm doing actually, this gossiping, it's like trying to do something with very little. So I'm I'm inflating a big balloon. And it's it becomes a very 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 complex labyrinth because this one element changes into the other one, and in this process, in the course of things, you have all sort of pseudo stylistical association with different other music also, which which creeps in literally, so to say. It's a very very virtuoso piece, and uh, uh, it's a sort of labyrinth, a spiral. The transformation loops are quite big at the beginning, and the more you go into piece, it it's it. It's uh, it becomes tighter and tighter until the whole thing simply collapses.
Jeu de Société by Denis Bouillon was heard in a performance here on KPFA, a um, piece which was written in 1981 and uh, recently recorded. The composer was born in French Canada, in Quebec, in 1955, and he currently lives in Cologne and is our special guest on this program. We're going to listen next to the piece which followed the one we just heard. This is your piano concerto. It's from 1982. Maybe you could uh, introduce us to the uh, piece. Yeah. It has a subtitle, huh? Uh, yes, actually, it's the real title. Uh, the Piano Concerto is actually the subtitle. Uh, if I try to tr translate that from the French, it would be like 12 drawers of half-truths to ease your descent. 12 drawers of half-truths to ease your descent. What's the French? Uh, 12 tiroirs de demi-vérité pour alléger votre descente. It sounds better in French somehow. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. It's like poetry, you know, it's difficult to translate. Denny, what does that mean? Um, actually, uh, I always like to give such titles to my pieces, and it sounds like surrealistical, or surrealistic, uh, but actually it's meta-surrealistic. And the funny thing is that I'm taking those surreal surrealistical titles literally. You have actually 12 movements, but I, I don't name them movements, I name them drawers, because it's like a jack-in-the-box. It's a big illusion. Again, the magician, you know, which, which opens a drawer and there's something strange which comes out, fly this uh, again, and the second one and the third one. And you have 12 drawers of half-truths. half true that means it's half-imaginary styles. There's absolutely no quotation of any existing music, but you're alluding to at least 12 or maybe more different styles, going, going from Gregorian chanting to uh, the, the current so jazz uh, pop jazz idioms, and to ease your descent, then uh, well, this is becoming a little more. Um, <laughs> you know um, what I'm doing is a sort of I, I think it's very decadent music. What I'm doing. Oh, well, it's a decadent period. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like that. You in know? general, in Western society. Yes, yeah. I think so. It's a, it's a mutation. We're going into some another direction, but what I'm doing actually is only only taking what what remains there and you know and playing with it. Many people who would perceive this as a decadent period would write a, an, an overtly political piece. Uh, well, I mean, one can draw his own conclusion if one wants. But uh, um, there's a big paradox in what I'm doing, actually. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not quoting, but I'm playing with remnants, rests of a tradition. That means that I consider that there's something decadent happening. But I pack my things in, in such a virtuoso and uh, polished packing envelope, that uh, it's almost a paradox. How can you believe that this, situ this our society is decadent, but give yourself the, the trouble, so much trouble, to make it so uh, so refined? You know, that's the paradox I I, I live in. So is there an equivalent in literature or in the visual arts to your work? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, um, this is what is called in literature uh, magical realism. And the best example for that is uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges. And uh, uh, um, um, an author which is now directly in that, goes in that direction, is certainly uh, uh, Garcia Marquez, which is now uh, with the Nobel Prize. Now, in what way would Borges be related to your work? What does he do that you do? Good. So, um, if you read a, a, a typical novel, short story by Borges, what happens? It starts like, uh, he, he, uh, yeah. he, starts, he tells you a small story, it's a very simple story, with every everyday uh, you know, facts. Very simple. And gradually, the more you read, a couple of paragraphs, 
without you really realizing what's happening, he injects some, let's say, more fantastic. Gradually, like you would have like a, a, a syringe. Uh, yes, a syringe, and, and, you, and you inject things. He injects gradually something which doesn't really belong to this first level. But you don't notice it at first. You don't notice it, or it's, it's so subtly done that you don't really notice it. So this is what you're doing in your music, and you start with some image, you draw the listener in. Yes, then a bait, actually. A bait, yes. yeah, then suddenly something changes slightly, and you d hardly notice it, and then you come out the other end, and it's completely different. Exactly. And you do this in the piano concerto also? Exactly, exactly. Uh, what is the bait? Uh, oh, the bait. You have, you have rap time. Or not really rack time, but pseudo rack time. You have allusions to Rachmaninoff, a romantic piano style, 19th century. So all these styles that you mentioned before, the twelve drawers. Huh? Yes. And they're easing our descent into the dissolution of society, huh? Oh well, I mean, uh, I, I, <laughs> in I, a way, I, I accept it if you say it, but uh, don't say that I said it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, performance. Who is who is performing this? Uh, it's um, uh, it's the, um, a recording made in, in Canada, in Quebec. It's the, the CBC Orchestra with uh, Normand Doyon, pianist, which is a French uh, Quebec pianist, which does a very fine job, actually, as you'll see. The conductor is named uh, Jean-Michel Boulet, which is a young conductor from Quebec City also. Well, this is uh, the piano concerto of Denis Bouillon, entitled 12 Drawers of Half-Truths to Ease Your Descent. Thank you. 
pense qu'à moi ou à tout le monde. Il en semble ainsi. Il ne s'ensuit pas qu'il en est ainsi. Ce que l'on peut fort bien se demander, c'est s'il y a sens à en douter.
Piano Concerto by Denis Bouillon, who is our guest on this program. That is a piece entitled Twelve Drawers of Half-Truths to Ease Your Descent. And it uh, is the second of our series of pieces by this composer, whose work we're introducing uh, now to audiences in California. This is Charles Armacani in Cologne at the studio of this composer. It's not a very large studio, is it? Actually, it's a tiny place. Uh, but you, you've organized it so Germanically. Yeah. <laughs> you see... We have here, over here, a DX7, a, a little keyboard, uh, looks like a spinet piano, yes. and a large composing rack, thousands of books and records and tapes, and all in the space... Recording of, equipment also. Yes, uh, recording, an entire recording studio. Yes. <laughs> and this room is no larger than, let's see, 13 feet by... 
10 feet, something well, like that? Well, and you also have the, the, the mansard. The yes, wall, you the have these not, stairs, uh, yes. sort of like an attic. So you have, yes, uh, <laughs> you lo you're losing space also. Yeah, that's right. It's like, you know, I, I calculated, uh, when I moved in here, I calculated as, uh, as uh, meticulously, uh, meticulously, uh, as when I compose a piece, you know, I had to make the best out of it. It is very small, so I had to use every centimeter, you know. <laughs> well, this you have done very well. <laughs> is it expensive you, uh, to live in Cologne? Or? Well, uh, actually not very much. Uh, you know, living is in, in Europe, uh, the rent is quite expensive. But, of course, if you go in big American cities, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, the rent is just as expensive. But I think living in Cologne is less expensive and as in living, for example, in, in uh, Berlin or Paris or uh, big uh, big European cities. Cologne is sort of it's one million or almost one million inhabitants, and it's possible to live cheap here. It's now possible. this has the biggest. Uh, I mean, oh, it's look. There's the two spires of the cathedral and some pigeons <laughs> walking. Around. I mean, you have such a great view from here. But um, uh, and you also are within walking distance of the largest music department of any radio station in the world, the West German yes. Radio. Have you had good relations with them, or do they play your music? You're an outsider, really. Uh, um, well, uh, well, I've been almost seven years here, and they played one piece, actually. And I think they broadcast it once. I mean, you can It's not very much. In other, it's not so it, easy to it, break in. It's not so how, easy. What is this, how is the system working here? Um, what happens if you want to have your music played on the radio? Uh, this I'd like to know, actually. <laughs> but, no, I can tell you. Um, Germany... Who's in control? Is it a committee which controls that, or is it a single person, or...? Uh, yes. And, and, you know, the, the, the new music life, actually, in Germany, when, this is, a, a, I think, a broad comment, is probably 99 percent the responsibility of of the uh, the broadcasters. Who, what, what was that? 99. 99 percent the, the 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 responsibility of the broadcasters. 99 percent the responsibility. I would of say so. there there's some major festivals, but more or less there's always a, a radio station which is going to sponsor it. You know, we are not there. So I that's mean, how they get their money to do their projects. Yes, yeah. yes. And actually, what happens? It's heavily subsidized. Almost 100 percent subsidized. The radio, the radio stations is all uh, state owned. So you have one producer which is in charge of the new music department, or two, kind of two and one assistant, or something like that. So if they don't particularly uh, take a liking to your music, you could wait a long time. You can wait you... a very long time, mm. actually, and uh, you will find some person which are willing to take risks. But a big radio station like Cologne, uh, it's difficult because they'll not, or they would. They will take some risks, but not that often. Uh, in Cologne, for example, they make big festivals with big names, you know, international composers. Uh, and uh, since my music is somehow difficult, it's... It's, it's outside the uh, mainstream of it's, German it, music. Yes. Right? Actually, it doesn't fit into the any category which is in vogue, so to say, now in Germany. What are those categories? There's Stockhausen, who's living here, there's Kagel. There's yes, I, I would the, say, I would like... The I new romanticism. Yes, in order not to, not to, uh, not to uh, be, uh, not to be unnice to anybody, I would, I would, I would try to avoid names and just the main currents. You, you have one big, one big restorative movement, which is the, the call the so-called new uh, new simplicity or new romanticism, and it's actually uh, um, uh, a generation of composers which are going back to their roots, so to say, the roots before the Second World War, which is German expressionism, and this is very understandable when you're here, and you understand how the music infrastructure functions in Germany. It's based on opera and symphonic music. And you have a big public which go to opera and attend opera performances and symphonic concerts. And if a young composers uh, work on that, on those, on that direction, you know, concert goer will understand very well Richard Strauss music, for example. And if you have those gestures, I don't mean if you copy that, but if you had the gestures where they use, to which they're used to, then there's a big chance that you'll you'll just fall into the right category and you're going to be played. It's a big opera renaissance also in Germany at the moment, for young composers, I mean. Everybody's writing an opera now. And this is one, one main category. But, uh, they're, but they're not writing operas like uh, Phil Glass uh, and no, that kind of opera. No, not at all. Not, not at all. that sense, the intermediate in, in, uh, Let's say, if you're going from uh, Alban Berg, Wozzeck, through uh, Bernd Aloy Zimmermann, Die Soldaten, and then in that direction with uh, Henze also in the background, and uh, Karl, Hadim, Karl Amadeus Hartmann also. Then you have the line there. The line is, is alive. It has it, been kept alive. Very traditional, though. 
Yes, I mean, uh, uh, it's the mainstream uh, 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 symphonic uh, music, you know. And, and the operas would tend to be narrative, liter literary pieces of some traditional... Yes, yes, yes more or less. Style. And very often, for example, you have very, very famous young composers, which are about my age now in Germany, which are drawing directly from Goethe, you know, or, or, uh, or Büchner, you know, the big romantic uh, stars. So we have the opera... Yes. Movement. What else? Yes, and then of the upper end, the concert music, which goes with that, you know. Then you have what I would call uh, the, uh, the the formalists, which uh, are uh, drawing from what Boulez wrote probably at the end of the sixties and Stockhausen at that time did. So um, you you one should never forget that the radio producers or the people which are responsible for the music festivals more more or less were trained in the fifties, get got their music education. In this fantastic period in Germany, with the 50s, it's, it's, it's the, the big renaissance, you know, after the war, there was nothing, and they, they started over. It's a very fascinating period. But a lot of people which are around 55 now, or 60, which are in the main job, so to say, were trained in that period. And it's still possible, now, if you're going to write uh, on that, follow that path, you know, post formalism or post serialism if you want that you will find in here there they will listen to you they are still uh, interested in that for a different reason this is a tradition which uh, had a strong foot foot set uh, set foothold, a strong foothold yes yeah. foothold still and and then you have a lot of composers which more or less write or if i want to be a little bit nasty rewrite that sort of music it's very difficult, you know, to, to, to try to work with the same tools as Boulez or Stokhausen did in the 60s and do better. I, I know no single example. But the door is open, I mean. And um, also you have what I would call uh, pseudo-minimal music, but more, uh, 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 let's see, more moral or philosophical oriented. For example, they have people around uh, Peter Michael Hamel. Uh, I don't know if his name in this is known oh, in the yes, state now. Oh yes, he comes to San Francisco yes. occasionally. Yes. Yes, and I think what he's doing, uh, I, don't, I don't mean that in a nasty way, but he's taking what the American minimalists did, or or actually are still developing, but uh, uh, thinking over it. It has a much more, a much more uh, intellectual approach to it. And the music is actually very close to that, but uh, it's as important for him to write about music as music itself. He's publishing books, actually, you know, and he gives lecture about it. And actually, one, one typical phenomenon in Germany is that the amount of literature which is written about music is just as big as the music itself, at the scores themselves. Yes, this I've noticed for a long time. Oh, yes. We don't have a good uh, tradition of writing about music in America. Mm -hmm. We really, Actually, we lack it. No, we, we need that very desperately, mm -hmm. but there are... The people who can do it uh, can't make a living at it, and mm -hmm. therefore they tend not to develop. I think. Yes, yeah, that's a big difference, of course. We have the same thing in Canada, also. I think it's even uh, more difficult in Canada because we do don't the, have big publishers. Do, do the writers here about music actually get their works published and get paid for writing them? Yes. Or? Oh, yes. Yeah. See, this uh, is the difference. Yeah. Typically, for example, you will have like you're doing a broadcast now. Uh, uh, let's suppose you're doing, doing that for German radio. You will sell your rights to the German radio, and then some magazine will get interested in it, and then it will pay you again to to rewrite it actually for for a publication in a paper, and then in in five years, if your uh, interview or article was con is considered as being important enough, it will be uh, published in a special book, you know, uh, about a certain subject, a certain topic. An anthology. Yeah. An anthology, and and this this. I mean, this, uh, this, this is a way a lot of books are made about new music nowadays. I mean, you're just sampling information which has been published for the last five or ten years in magazines, and then you put them together. Well, that's a very interesting analysis. What about the electronic music composers here? Ah, this is like uh, sort of uh, uh, for something of the past almost, you know? In the 50s and beginning of the 60s, there was the, 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 the Cologne studio, the well, electronic let, studio. Let's just, well, okay, but In the radio, which was very famous. But nowadays... What about computer music then? Ah, yeah, this is something different. Yeah. Uh, now, one has to consider that the big computer centrum, center in Europe is in IRCAM in Paris. Everybody knows that, and it's parallel to Stanford University, and there are several alt centers in the States. We know that also. 
But the way uh, uh, the infrastructure in France is organized is very different in Germany. You don't have one big capital in Germany. You have Bonn, of course, but it's not a capital. It's a political place. You but know. not culturally. It's not a capital. cultural capital at all. Of course, they, they inject money into it to make it look like a capital. And now they like have Ottawa and Canada, but it's not a cultural capital. For our listeners uh, in the Bay Area, that's where Dennis Russell Davies is now the head of uh, new music and, and opera and symphony. Yes. He's sort of the head of all of that, apparently. Uh, Beethoven, in Beethoven Halle, Beethoven Orchestra in Bonn, I think. That yes, but apparently he has a charge of new music activities as well. That's what I yes, mean. yes. Yeah. And there's a, the music festival also, which is called the Culture Forum in Bonn. But I'm not so sure if it's, if it's exactly that what you mean, but I, I, I assume he has to do but that But it's also. not the cultural capital of Germany. That's no, not sure, at all. Yeah. And that's the big difference, you know. In Germany, you have a lot of large cities, but no big capital like Paris. So wh what happened in Irkham? It's the big concentration of money, which... Uh, 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 made it possible to develop, to create one of the most important studio in the world with computer, and which you have permanent researchers there, specialist acoustics and psychology and music psychology and everything, and composer which are invited also. No German city now has the possibility to do that. So what you have is a fragmentation. The scene is is uh, is splittered, and you have, for example, in Cologne, no computer music studio. What you have, you have several composers which have their own more or less home computer or sometimes a little bit bigger but you don't have any facility which can compare to uh, to Irkham. What I know now, I know that uh, in the South Germany now around Karlsruhe they are planning something, a bigger studio but it will never be able for them to compete directly with Irkham. But I think in Germany uh, computer music in itself is not the main interest and the one which uh, which uh, get involved into that have to do it with their own means, almost literally. It's interesting to see that Virgo Records, uh, <clears throat> the important uh, company which does a lot of contemporary music in Germany, is now bringing out a computer music series on compact disc, and almost all of the pieces are by Americans or French composers. And that's true. That's true. In Cologne, you have Clarence Barlow, which you probably know, the composer, which which uh, probably known through the um, computer music. Uh, conference, international conference in the States in the meantime, and Computer Music Journal also. He wrote something in, in that journal, I think, several years ago. And uh, But if you meet Clarence, you'll realize that he's, he sits in his home, and he has his own computer, and he's making everything, writing his own program. I mean, from from scratch to, mm. to, the, to the music mm. itself. It's a totally different approach, approach than IRCAM. At IRCAM, if you're blessed enough to be invited as a guest, uh, guest composer, then you'll have at least two assistants and an and array of, I mean, fantastic equipment and documentation which is there, which you can draw from. If you're working alone, it's, it's a totally different matter. <laughs> so, Denis Bouillon, you've told us a bit about the scene in Germany. Where do you fit in this scene? Well, I mean, I can, I think what I can tell you is, quote, um, there is one one musicologist which made a broadcast on my music in uh, last September, September 86, for the, 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 the Frankfurt radio station. And he, he came out with the idea that I was an outsider. And I think he's quite right. I mean, I know some people, uh, but I don't think that purely musically my music fits in any of the categories which, is, which are now in vogue uh, here in Germany. And um, for, some, for, for several reasons. I think, you know, that's speculation, but I think that one of the reasons is that I don't have a very uh, respectful approach or uh, contact with tradition. I like, I love musical, uh, I, I love the music tradition, I, I love the great romantics, I mean, but I don't feel that I have to carry this tradition on my shoulder, so I allow myself to play with it. And in several circles, it might not be always welcome. There's also one, one thing um, which might play a role it's like, uh, is this probably which comes from the music itself? It's this paradox that uh, I'm I could be understood probably by uh, let's say alternative people, which are more or less talking of postmodernism or decadent culture, or everything. But the way I work is uh, in a very I work in a very refined way, in a very classical way, in a sort. So they might be uh, um, they might not really want to get in touch with that because it's. The package is too, uh, it's too nice. You see, that's the. So I don't get very, very uh, um, um, along very well with uh, the most radical people, nor with the most conservative people. 
So I I feel like in a no man's land at the moment. And uh, but you know uh, the music scene in Germany is something very special. Uh, they are great music lovers. They love music, and they love to talk about music also a lot, and to write about music. And when somebody decides that what you're doing is something interesting, then it, they'll do wonder for you. And that's why Germany attracts so many foreign composer, artists, writers, because there's a possibility there to have an audience, a forum. And they might ignore you for a very long time, but one always hopes that uh, somebody's going to say, oh, look, he's been doing that for the last 20 years. And Well, they did that with Morton Feldman. Exactly. It's a very good phenomenon. Uh, and now Morton Feldman is like deified. You know, is considered like, like a god, a guru now in Germany, which deified? is very funny. Deified. A deified. God. Oh, yeah. You see? Uh, considered like a big guru. And, 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 and sometimes, I mean... It, turns to extreme. I mean, they will collect everything, every cigarette butt, you know, or whatever, <laughs> every drop of, of, uh, of sweat or whatever, and put it in a glass. I mean, I'm just uh, fooling around, fooling a little bit, but... Did they do that with Cage, do you think? Yes, oh yes. For the last Starting 20, when? 20 years. 20 years. You know, uh, a month ago, no, not, not a month ago, that's... Uh, yeah, February 14th. February, that's uh, that already three Valentine's months Day, ago. Yeah. There was 24 hours live uh, cage music, but not organized particularly by the music department. More well, yes, with the music department and the Hirschpiel department. Yes, yes, that that's the, the Hirschpiel and music yeah. department. It, 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 it was hand in hand because the cage night there was, day. It, it, <laughs> yes, there, there was there was like uh, I think ten ensembles also which were invited, you know. So it's a big collaboration, and I mean, you can imagine they were only uh, uh, the, the the news in in the meantime, but the rest twenty four hours and the whole city. In all all concert all, uh, uh, sal, uh, room, all, all the, all hall, concert halls yes. were monopolized. By. It's fantastic. It's one of the most interesting things which, which happened for Cage in, the whole, in his whole life, I'm sure. Well, he got the Legion of Honor Award from Paris, also from Jacques Lang in, yes. in 82. And uh, the U.S. hasn't done anything for him. <laughs> you know, the U.S. government uh, gives every year awards to some of its most famous artists. But the Pulitzer Prize or... But no, 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 no. This is a that? different one. It's given by the president. And Ronald uh -huh. Reagan has been uh, giving them to... Uh, well, always having a, a nice dis disposition of people, but but especially to have a movie star in each one of them. Yes, so yes. They this nominated Cage <laughs> one year, and yeah. uh, apparently he was considered too controversial, but they, they uh, gave it to Elliot Carter instead, I think. And uh, Merce Cunningham did receive one of these medals at, yes. at the White House. But <laughs> it's, it's really kind of a strange uh, thing yes. that Cage would come and, to France and to Germany and be yeah. honored in this way. And yeah, in yes. his own country, he's... Uh, yeah. Ignored. Yeah, but but the way, interestingly sure. enough, the way the German will honor somebody is is, is is something in itself. You know, it's it's it becomes it becomes like the German likes heroes very much. They like figures in which they can pro project themselves, and um, it, it's it's nice for them to say, okay, this is one main figure, and we understand that. The word understand is very important. And for the next 10 years or 20 years or 5 years or whatever, this is going to be uh, the main light. And from that, we can build something. It's very coherent. I don't think they don't like too much when tradition is, is uh, uh, too rapidly uh, changed or, or slides or slips. or They need like uh, precise uh, uh, orientation. Points. And once they find that, they tend to do a very complete job of... Yes, oh, of, they're thorough. They're really thorough. It is fantastic, in a way. It's a way of seeing things, you know. I don't complain. Uh, uh, it, it can have fantastic results. Where in the world, some uh, uh, for example, sorry, where in the world uh, uh, would, would a radio station invest so much for... For example, that was Cage. It, it had been done for other composers also. It's not the only one. Well, this radio station spends more money on music than any other in the world, so it's not I would not say, comparable. I would think so. I, I would think so. <laughs> no, it's so. really true. Yes. I think their budget is just <laughs> enormous. Um, I'll never forget hearing uh, uh, Dr. Krings, the late uh, director of the music department in 85, talking about their uh, series of Orthodox church music, and instead mm -hmm. of playing recordings from Greek and Armenian and Russian Orthodox choirs. They flew the choirs to Cologne. They had the live musicians. <laughs> and they put them on from midnight to 7 a.m., seven hours of their entire repertoire, and then they sent them back to Athens and Yerevan and so it's forth. It's fantastic. Yeah, now this is unbelievable. Yes, yes, yes. And of course, I mean, getting back to my my own little small situation, uh, that's what I think everybody which which wants to stay longer in Cologne hopes at some point that somebody is going to 
to listen at some point. I noticed also that George Ligeti, who is your teacher, is outside the mainstream, and, and uh, in some ways there's a parallel there between your careers. And, and I hear in his new music and your new music some very interesting cross-references. Of course, uh, of course. I think in his trio, which was written after your uh, Wind Quintet with Society Piano, Society Games, yes. Society Games, which mm -hmm. opened the program, you hear some things that maybe Ligeti picked up on. Huh? It's it's possible, you know. It's cross. Um, how do you say cross? Fertilization. Exactly, exactly that. So we have. Uh, it's it's very clear that you're very close to him. Still? Oh yes, oh yes. Of course, uh, I've not been a student anymore since the last two um, last two years. I've been studying until uh, up until uh, eighty five, but we have the close contact. Uh, as often as I can, I can allow myself, and I would go to Hamburg, and of course we we still communicate on a very warm basis. What did he give to you that was the most important thing? Actually, I think that was the the. It gave me a, 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 an opportunity to find something. Uh, it forced me to. Uh, if it put me against the wall, that's what he did. Ligeti will never come with any prefabricated solution. He has his own very strong ideas and aesthetic goals, of course, and I respect them very much. I don't, you know, we agree on. I think on a lot of things. We don't agree on everything, which is pretty normal, but um, it's so critical. That is going to force you. Either is going to either crush you, or if you if you can overcome that, then you might become stronger. That's that's the most important thing. You share an admiration for the music of Ives and Nan Caro. Of course, uh, this is part of the the let's say the the circle of of, of composers which we are which we are very interested in. Especially that's not in. very Germanic. That's not. But of course, he's from That's Hungary. Not. You're from French Canada. This is yes. Uh, these, these are uh, forces which are outside the Germanic tradition entirely. I mean, for, yes. Although I noticed recently that Herbert Hank made some records of Ives' piano music that were very successful. It's fantastic. I mean, he just played uh, two days ago uh, the, the the first sonata. Uh, Herbert Hank is is well one of the best interpreter of Ives, I think. And one of the people in tune with a little more in tune with American music, perhaps. Yes, so. of course. I mean, uh, you you certainly know Neuland, the the the, the journal, the, the five the five journals, uh, which uh, Herbert so uh, was the editor for. I mean, not only the editor, but he he he, uh, he typed them by he typed hand, by hand, yeah. everything. I mean, this is uh, this again uh, not uh, another example of how thorough when in Germany when somebody decided to do something. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's this work is absolutely fascinating. I made an interview with uh, with Ligeti for for a Canadian paper uh, several years ago, and we translated the whole thing. Herbert and I for that for his magazine, and it's himself. He translates everything himself. It's it's fascinating, and yes, but um, getting back to this uh, outsider. Uh, um, a mentality. Ligeti, uh, I will tell you something which is funny, but Ligeti has been uh, mistakenly uh, labeled as a new music composer. And uh, he was very successful in, in the 60s, but Ligeti is not, was not part of the avant-garde. He was not. I mean, I, I'm, I'm poking fun, but Ligeti, um, what he's been doing is a very, very classical work. He's a very classical composer. And actually, it's funny because he had a connection with Fluxus and, and very, very, very radical so um, movements in the 60s. But uh, he was a sort of uh, um, orbital... Um, um, okay. Yes, I mean, getting close to those circles, getting back again, getting closer, you know, an, an ellipse uh, orbit, you know. So not, he was some, somewhat uh, aware of them, but he wasn't a part of them. He was not a part. He was never part of anything, I think. And this, uh, on a... On a, on a, on a on a broad basis, this I would probably share with him, this idea that I don't feel like I belong to any particular uh, circle of, of, of composer or artist. Or I have strong links to a lot of things, but I don't feel like being part of something very specifically, so, uh, on a pure social basis also. seems to me another thing that you did that was different from the German mainstream was to incorporate uh, very strong jazz elements in some of your pieces, and the one we're going to hear next is a little bit based on uh, some yes. very strong jazz feeling. Would, uh, would you would you characterize your interest in jazz as being for a particular few artists or a ge more generalized approach? Actually, um, you know, um, as I told you at the beginning, I'm drawing from all sort of traditions. Jazz is one of the traditions I'm drawing from, and this is, I think, a purely personal thing. I just like jazz. It's so simply, I mean. Uh, but are we talking about uh, jazz from the twenties or? Oh yes, uh, mainstream. Uh, no, I or? would say I would say bebop, and 
uh, just before what we call the fusion jazz with with rock, and then uh, I I like that. Miles actually. Davis uh, T- uh, uh, up to Bitches Brew, let's say let's say uh, Miles Davis of the bebop era up to Bitches Brew. That's your favorite you period, yeah. Oh yes, well I like Charlie Parker very much. Also, well the father of the bebop actually, the, the real bebop, the hardcore bebop. But uh, I just I just like it that way. I mean, it's a purely personal. It's not. It's no commentary on the value of anything. You know, it's just it gets it gets closer to me. I mean, what happens in this next piece we're going to hear? It's co- first of all, what's the title? Oh, it's it's, it's a little, little difficult to to translate. Comme un silène entrouvert. It's like a half open silenus. Which is a kind of a, an apothecary jar. Huh? Exactly. So, uh, if I try to summarize that briefly, the, the, the piece is based on a quotation by Rabelais, the 14th century uh, um, uh, physis, physis, physician and, and writer. Not physicist, that's the big problem in English. <laughs> physician and writer. And uh, um, uh, you probably know the big, this famous book, Gargantua. And the prologue of this book in this prologue, uh, Rabelais says, Take care, reader. My book is going to be like a silène. And I scratched a little bit and I found out what he meant like that. That means uh, silène is one of the satire, which is a, a good friend of Bacchus in the Bacchanals or Dionysus in the Greek mythology. And is always half naked, half drunk with, with the nice girls and that's a pretty and jolly fellow. You see that on the jar. It's painted, yes. painted on these jars. Yes, exactly. That's one of the favorites uh, favorite motives, which was painted uh, uh, on those jars uh, in the 14th century. That's or, amusing. Yes, very interesting. I wonder why. Um, I don't know. That, that would be very interesting. There's medicine in those jars? Yes, that's it. So, um, they, they kept ointments and medicines and uh, Aphrodisiacs, potions. maybe. Al- yeah. <laughs> also, you know. And uh, actually what, what Rabelais says is that, take care, my piece, my gargantua is like a silen. That means on the outside, it's very... Uh, uh, trivial scenes which are painted lascivious and everything but in the inside you find you find you will find something much more refined so uh, actually that's the big play on what it looks like and what it is actually you know shine und sein uh, in german um and what i'm doing i'm starting with uh, a sort of dance a pseudo dance the silen would be dancing drunken, you know, with very lascivious. It's a sort of jazz which you could have possibly heard. I was never there. Can you play it for this on the piano? Yes, yeah, I can. Let's go yeah, over I here. Can, I can just play it back. We'll just move over to the instrument here. So what I have is a, is a basic melodico harmonic uh, fragment, which sounds like that, in, in its metrical form. <laughs> I'm doing this is the, the more the clearest way I'm, I'm I'm exposing it. At the beginning, I'm only I'm dislocating it only into fragment. It would sound more like you know it's fragmental. It's a it's a virtual metric which is there, but it's not it's not very precise. And the more you go in the piece, it will become more metrical. You feel a stronger uh, meter, and this is this music is used. You could have heard it probably in a Chicago bar in 1966 around four o'clock in the morning, something like that. I mean, I was never there, but I, <laughs> I, I figured out it would was something like that. And uh, I'm moving the whole piece. You know, it's a very complex thing. There are two trios, and there are two imaginary trios on tape, and it's a very strong, uh, complex structural playing actually. But all those guys get together at some point, and they get more metrical, they're more swingy. And when they get together, on the verge of getting together, then the transformation occurs. You start from the outside, and then you're going to go into the inside and find something totally different. And what you find is a sort of stylization of a Gregorian chant, which goes like... You see? And How does that relate? What's the original melody now? And, uh... But what I'm doing, I'm harmonizing the chanting. That's very sentimental. Huh? Oh, very sentimental. And then you have my Silen music, which is transformed through this chanting. Oh, that's a 
a surprise ending, isn't it? Yeah. It's from that? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> well, I mean, if you wish.
You've heard a very beautiful piece of music by Denis Bouillon, our guest on this KPFA program. That is called Comme une silène entrouverte, composed in 1983 and 1984 and performed by the Ensemble Köln at the West German Radio in Cologne in January of 1987. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to a rather distinctive figure in German music. Denis Bouillon was born in Quebec in 1955 and since 1980 has lived in Germany. He's a very lively, warm, fascinating individual and his influence from the composer from the United States, Charles Ives, is apparent in that last piece. As you hear many fragments of tunes put one over the other and... uh, rearranged in time in a very interesting way. He's also been influenced by his teacher, George Ligeti, who is another transplanted composer living in Germany. Born in Hungary, Ligeti was famous in the early 60s for those marvelous orchestral pieces with sheets of sound, all the instruments playing different notes at the same time, as opposed to a whole string section, for example, playing only three or four tones. You have uh, 50 or 60. And uh, Ligeti's music, of course, was featured in the famous film 2001. And many people became familiar with it through that film. Um, another of the composers who influenced Denis Bouillon is Conlon Nancaro, the American living in Mexico City, who writes studies for player piano in which several different tempos are played at the same time in different instruments or different voices of a canon. It was interesting to hear Bouillon's commentary as a bit of an outsider and his analysis of the contemporary German music scene as part of this program and to be introduced, I think, to his brand of magical realism, he calls it, in music. He was influenced, of course, also by the drawings of Escher and you hear that in the kind of cryptic uh, formations that his musical language takes. I received a letter from Denis Bouillon after our June 1st, 1987 interview in Cologne, just recently, and in it he informed me that Dennis Russell Davies, the American conductor, whom many of us know through his work with the Cabrillo Music Festival, has decided to play Bouillon's Concerto for Orchestra, so a nice connection has been made there between an American conductor living in Bonn, 30 miles away from Cologne, and this young French-Canadian who has great difficulty having his music performed in Germany. And uh, I hope we'll be hearing more of Bouillon's music in the future. There are many other pieces which he has sent to me here at KPFA, and I hope to broadcast some of them for you in the coming year. This is Charles Amerikanian, and you've been listening to The Morning Concert on listener-sponsored KPFA. Our engineer for this program, heard by recording, is Tom McElhaney.